Hi, Lolly's back here at Book Club for Are You There, Got It to Me, Margaret. I'm going to read Chapter 12. On December 11th, Grandma sailed on a three-week cruise to the Caribbean. She went every year. She had a Bon Voyage party. That's a party you have when people are going on a trip. And sometimes uh, people give them gifts and stuff to wish them luck and fun for their trip. So she had a Bon Voyage party in her room on the ship. This year I was allowed to go. My mother gave Grandma a green silk box to keep her jewelry safe. It was very nice, all lined in white velvet. Grandma said thank you and that all her jewelry was for her Margaret anyway so that she had to take good care of it. Grandma's always reminding me of how nobody lives forever and everything she has is for me. And I hate it when she talks like that. She once told me she had her lawyer prepare her funeral instructions so things would go the way she planned, such as the kind of box or coffin she would be buried in and that she doesn't want any speeches at all, that I should only come once or twice a year to see her grave to see that her grave is looking nice and neat we stayed on the ship half an hour and then grandma kissed me goodbye and promised to take me along with her one of these days the next week my mother started to address her christmas cards and for days at a time she was frantically busy with them she doesn't call them christmas cards holiday greetings she says we don't celebrate christmas exactly we give presents but my parents say that it's a traditional American custom. My father says my mother and her greetings heart cards have to do with her childhood. She sends them to pe people she grew up with, and they send cards back to her. So once a year, she finds out who married whom and who had what kids and stuff like that. Also, she sends one to her brother, whom I've never met. He lives in California. This year, I discovered something really strange. I discovered that my mother was sending a Christmas card to her parents in Ohio. I find out because I was looking through the pile of cards one day when I had a cold and stayed home from school. There it was, just like that. The envelope was addressed. The envelope said Mr. and Mrs. Paul Hutch Hutchins, and that's them, my grandparents. I didn't mention anything about them. That to my mother. I had the feeling I wasn't supposed to know. In school, Mr. Bennett was running around trying to find out what happened to the new choir robes. The whole school was putting on Christmas Hanukkah pageant for the parents, and our sixth grade class was the choir. We didn't even have to try out. Mr. Bennett's class was the choir, the principal announced. We practiced singing every day with the music teacher. I thought by the time Christmas finally rolled around, I wouldn't have any voice left. We learned five Christmas carols and three Hanukkah songs, alto and soprano parts. Most of the boys sang alto and the girls sang soprano. We'd been measured for our new choir robes right after Thanksgiving. The PTA decided the old ones were really worn out. Our new ones would be green instead of black. We all had to carry pencil-sized flashlights instead of candles. We practiced marching down the aisles and into the auditorium singing Aldes Fidelis in English and Latin. We marched in two lines, boys and girls, and naturally in size places. I walked right behind Janie because Ruth had moved away. My partner turned out to be Norman Fishbein. I never looked at him. I just marched looking straight ahead singing very loud. A week before the pageant, Alan Gordon told Mr. Bennett that he wasn't going to sing the Christmas songs because it was against his religion. Then Lisa Murphy raised her hand and said that she wasn't going to sing the Hanukkah songs because it was against her religion. Mr. Bennett explained that songs were for everyone and had nothing to do with, with religion. But the next day, Alan brought a note from home and from then on, he marched, but he didn't sing. Lisa sang when we marched, but she didn't even move her lips during the Hanukkah songs. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. I want to know. 
I'm giving a lot of thought to Christmas and Hanukkah this year. I'm trying to decide if one might be special for me. I'm really thinking hard, God, but so far I haven't come up with any answers. Our new green choir robes were delivered to the school the day before the pageant, and we were sent home with with us to be pressed or ironed. The best thing about the pageant, besides wearing the robe and carrying the flashlight, was that I got to sit in the first row of the choir seats facing the audience, which meant that the kindergarten kids were right in front of me. Some of them tried to touch our feet with their feet. One little kid wet his pants during the scene when Mary and Joseph came to the end. He made a puddle on the floor right in front of Janie. Janie had to keep on singing and pretend she didn't know. It was pretty hard not to laugh. School closed for vacation right after the pageant. When I got home, my mother told me I had a letter. Let's read chapter 13. Margaret, you got a letter, my mother called from the studio. It's on the front table. It's just about... I just about never got any letters, probably because I never write anybody back. So I dashed over to the front table and picked it up. Miss Margaret Simon, it said. I turned the envelope around, but there was no return address. I wondered who sent it. Wondering made it much more fun than ripping it open and knowing right away. It was probably just an advertisement anyways. Finally, when I couldn't stand any more, I opened it very slowly and very carefully so I wouldn't rip up the envelope. It was an invitation. I knew right away because of the picture, a bunch of kids dancing around a record. Also, it said, having a party. Who's having a party, I thought. Who's having a party and invited me? Naturally, I would have found out right away. I could have looked inside, but this was better. I considered the possibilities. It couldn't be a PTS member because... I would have known. It could be somebody I know from New York or camp, except I haven't written to any old friends to tell them in my new address. Anyway, the envelope was postmarked New Jersey. Let's see, I thought. Hmm, who could it be? Who? Finally, I opened it. Came. Come on over. Saturday, December 20th, from 5 to 9 p.m. Supper, 1334 Wittenham Terrace, Norman Fishbein. Norman Fishbein, I yelled. That drip. I never even talked to him. Why would he invite me to his party? Still, a party is a party, and for supper, too. Hey, Mom, I yelled, running into the studio. My mother was standing away from her canvas, studying her work. Her paintbrush was in her mouth, between her teeth. Guess what, Mom? What? She said, not taking the paintbrush away. I'm invited to a supper party. Here, look. I showed her my invitation. She read it. Who's Norman Fishbine? She she took the paintbrush out of her mouth. A kid in my class. Do you like him? He's okay. Can I go? Well, I suppose so. My mother dabbed some red paint on her canvas. Then the phone rang. I'll get it. I ran into the kitchen and said a breathless hello. It's Nancy. Did you get invited? Yes, I said. Did you? Hmm. We all did. Janie and Gretchen, too? Can you go? Sure. Me, too. I've never been to a supper party, Nancy said. Me, either. Should we dress up, I asked. My mother's going to call Miss Fishbine. I'll let you know. She hung up. Ten minutes later, the phone rang. I answered, Margaret, it's me again. I know. You'll never believe this, Nancy said. What? What won't I believe? We're all invited. What do you mean all? Our whole class. All 28 of us. That's what Miss Fishbine told my mother. Even Laura? I guess so. Do you think she'll come? I asked, trying to picture Laura at the party. Well, her mother and Mrs. Fishbine work a lot of committees together, so maybe her mother will make her. How about Philip Leroy? He's invited. That's all I know. And Miss Fishpine said, definitely party clothes. When I hung up, I raced back to the studio. Mom, our whole class is invited. Your whole class? 
My mother put her paintbrush down and looked at me. Yes, all 28 of us. Miss Fishbine must be crazy, my mother said. Should I wear my velvet, do you think? It's your best, you might as well. Back then, people dressed up for churches and parties. On the way, on the day of the party, I talked to Nancy six times, to Janie three times, and to Gretchen twice. Nancy called me back every time she changed her mind about what to wear, and each time she asked me if I was still wearing my velvet. I told her I was. The rest of the time, we made our arrangements. We decided that Nancy would sleep over at my house and that Gretchen would sleep over at Janie's. Mr. Wheeler would drive all of us to the party and Mr. Lemus would drive us home. My mother washed my hair at two o'clock. She gave me a cream rinse too, so I wouldn't get tangles. She set it in big rollers all over my head. I sat under her hair dryer. Then she filed my nails with an emery board instead of just cutting them like usual. My velvet dress was already laid out on my bed along with my new underwear, party dress, and tights. My new underwear was not the ordinary cotton kind it was not on, trimmed with lace around the edges. It was supposed to be one of my December tradition gifts. All afternoon, I kept thinking that maybe Norman Fishbine wasn't such a drip. After my bath, I was supposed to go to my room and rest so I'd be in good shape for the party. I went to my room and closed the door, only I didn't feel like resting. What I did was move my desk chair in front of my dresser mirror. Then I stood on the chair and took off my robe. I stood naked in front of the mirror. I was staring to get, I was starting to get some hairs. I turned around and studied myself sideways. Then I got off the chair and moved it closer to the mirror. I stood back up on it and looked again. My head looked funny with all those rollers. The rest of me looked the same. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. I hate to remind you, God. I mean, I know you're busy, but I already, but it's already December and I'm not growing. At least I don't even see any real difference. Isn't it time, God? Do you think I've waited patiently? Please help me. I hopped off the chair and sat down on the edge of my bed, putting on my clean underwear and tights. Then I stood in front of the mirror again. I didn't look at myself for a long time. I went into the bathroom and opened the back bottom cabinet. There was a whole box of cotton balls, sterile until opened, the package said. I reached in and grabbed a few. My heart was pounding, which seemed stupid because what was I so afraid of anyhow? I mean, if my mother saw me grab some cotton balls, she wouldn't say anything. I used them all the time to put calamine on my summer mosquito bites to clean off cuts and bruises, to put on my face lotion at night. But my heart kept pounding anyway because I knew I was going, what I was going to do with the cotton balls. I tiptoed back to my room and closed the door. I stepped in my closet and stood in one corner. I shoved three cotton balls in each side of my bra. Well, so what if, that, so what if it is cheating? Probably other girls did it. It looked a lot better, wouldn't I? So why not? I came out of the closet and got back onto the chair. This time, I turned sideways. I looked like I was grown. I liked it. Are you there, God? See how nice my bra looks new? That's all I need, just a little help. It really, it's, I'll really be good around the house, God. I'll clear the table every night for a month at least. Please, God. Okay, tune in next time when we read chapter 14.